Mega Man X has one of the most celebrated soundtracks of the Super Nintendo era. From the beginning, Mega Man music has always had this driving rock energy to it, but for the first time in the series, X was able to use actual rock sounds to accentuate this. With the Super Nintendo's ability to sample real instrument sounds, we could trade out the square and triangle waves of the NES for screaming electric guitar, big fat drum sounds, and bass samples that slap in that way that only the Super Nintendo could do. Thanks to the new tools at hand, the style of composition changed quite a bit from the NES era. But an interesting thing happened when Capcom began releasing a spin-off series called Mega Man Xtreme. These games took levels and bosses and music from Mega Man X and X2 and remade them to fit on the Game Boy Color, which had very similar capabilities to the NES in terms of audio. This means that music that had been created with the Super Nintendo's 8-channel and sampling capabilities in mind had to be reworked back into a classic 4-channel format. Comparing the two soundtracks shows how each console's strengths and weaknesses affect how the music is put together. There are plenty of differences between the two versions of the same tunes. Some of them are clearly technical to fit on the more limited hardware, but others improve drastically on the original versions in ways that make me wonder if restrictions really do breed creativity. For a quick and obvious example of what I mean, let's compare the stage start stinger between the two games. First, the original games. This energetic, syncopated figure starts on a C minor chord, then moves down to B flat. The pace quickens as we get a shortened version of this figure played twice in one bar over this F sharp diminished chord that blows up into the final fanfare over a G chord. Each melodic figure is filled in with bombastic drum fills and this repeated 16th note figure in the bass. Now, let's take a listen to the Game Boy version. The hardware couldn't handle drum fills quite as bombastic as these, so this time, the space between the melody is filled in with nose-crinklingly sick bass fills. Now, these bass fills are totally in line with the Mega Man sound established by earlier NES games, and they're so much more exciting to listen to than the bass figure filling out the Super Nintendo version. This one is not an example of technical limitations. They could have stuck to the original bass part and it would have worked out fine. The bass truly did not have to go this hard. But it's a more than welcome addition to the stinger. For another example of the Game Boy versions making additions to the music, let's look at Extreme 2's version of the Flame Mammoth stage theme. The original X version is all about power chords. For those of you who don't play guitar, power chords are chords using only the root and fifth, usually played on electric guitar in the lowest register. To say these are idiomatic of the rock style would be an understatement, and we see them chugging away as the accompaniment beneath the melody throughout this tune. The thing about power chords is that they are harmonically inconclusive. Without the third of the chord in the voicing, the implied quality of each chord, whether the chord is major or minor, is determined by the context of the rest of the tune. For example, Flame Mammoth is very clearly in the key of F minor, with the melody taking a leisurely walk from the 5th to the root of an F minor scale right at the beginning. So even though the rhythm section never plays an F minor or a B flat minor chord, we still hear this repeated progression of F and B flat power chords as being F minor to B flat minor because of the context of the key as established by the melody and the riffs that break up each melodic phrase. These kinds of chords sound great with a classic rock band instrumentation, low guitars and bass and driving drums, but the Game Boy version of this track doesn't have any of those things. We do keep the pounding 8th note bass line and the noise channel performs admirably as a drum part, but now the chugging guitar parts are replaced with this 8th note counter line that covers all of the chord tones of each chord. What's this? Those aren't B-flat minor chords! The arrangers here took the opportunity to ditch the simple 1-4 to four chord progression in favor of something more intricate. 
harmonizing the melody with an F minor to B flat major to F minor to C7 progression. Now it's true that the original tune was ambiguous as to whether its four chord was major or minor, we didn't see any thirds either way, in the melody or the accompaniment, but having the major four chord spelled out explicitly like this gives a sense of the music lifting itself up. And then the C7 here at the end brings the music a kind of snarky energy. You could say that it's a trade-off losing the rock aesthetic that the chugging power chords brought to the music, but being able to set up and then play with your expectations harmonically like this seems like a much more musical move to me. Whether it's because of the hardware or not, the extreme soundtracks do a lot of trading off the rock aesthetic for other interesting musical ideas. If we look at Mega Man X's Armored Armadillo theme, we see the whole track is propelled by the rhythm of this classic punk drum beat. This part emphasizes a repeated rhythm that's known as the pop clave rhythm or tricio rhythm that you can find basically everywhere in music. It sounds like this. The main guitar parts and organ part are playing this rhythm explicitly in their melody, while the other guitar part fills in the spaces with catchy syncopated lines. The bass part also plays the tricio rhythm, but rhythmically approaches the second and third notes of the pattern, adding in a sixteenth note before each main note to give them a little more emphasis. This mirrors the way the snare and kick drum line up in the drum part, giving us a locked together rhythm section to drive the tune underneath all of the flashy stuff. Now this feels pretty kick-ass but if we take a look at the bass line in isolation, it's pretty uninteresting. We stick to the root of each chord locked in this rhythmic pattern, with the only movement seen throughout the whole tune being a one note walk up or down to connect the F and A minor chords that trade throughout the bulk of the piece. By contrast, Extreme's version of the Armored Armadillo theme lets the bass part take up a lot more space in the arrangement, probably because there's a lot more space to take up without being able to double parts with organ and guitars and play with stereo width and such. So instead of this one note bass pattern, the same rhythmic idea is extrapolated out into this bouncy bass line which creates a ton of energy. The same repeated rhythmic pattern is never broken, but the more active role the bass takes here makes it act more like a counterline to the melody rather than a part of the rhythm section to be felt and not necessarily paid attention to. The subtle shift in emphasis here also changes the rhythmic concept quite a bit. In the original Super Nintendo version, this pop clave figure was placed as a cross rhythm against the double time backbeat in the snare drum, which gives the music a drive but also a certain heaviness. The bass in this arrangement is very much supporting the drum beat, which is beating us over the head with the backbeat throughout the tune. The Game Boy version's noise channel is nowhere near as powerful as these drum samples, so in this case the noise channel supports the bass line, with a cross rhythm emphasizing the rhythmic approach notes, once again coming in a sixteenth note before the second and third notes in the pop clave pattern to give them just a little more push. Emphasizing this tricio rhythm more in the bass and approaching those notes with the equivalent of a snare part gives us a surprisingly different rhythmic feel than having a steady backbeat pulse in the snare. Let's listen to the Super Nintendo's backbeat version of this beat again, then simply flip the final kick and snare notes to emulate what the Game Boy version is getting at. We went from punk to dance hall really quickly, didn't we? It's such a small change, but we're talking about the foundational layer of the music here, and small adjustments like this can change the character of a piece quite a lot. It's like the butterfly effect. That isn't where the rhythmic adjustments stop, either. When we move into this guitar solo section in the original version, the bass and drums continue on the way they've been playing for the whole tune up to this point.
In the Game Boy version, the rhythmic pattern gets stretched out a little bit. Rather than emphasizing two dotted eighth notes and one eighth note to fit into a two beat long pattern, the bass and noise channel all of a sudden start playing a four dotted eighth note and two eighth note pattern that takes up a whole bar. It's the same rhythmic concept, just extrapolated on, a kind of curveball development to surprise the listener. If we isolate the main rhythm here in the bass, the part outlines the chord tones of each chord super clearly, but it also continues to add in rhythmic approach notes throughout the pattern with the root of each chord bumped up an octave, making the rhythm feel even more complicated and busy and intense. Yes, we lost the punk rock feel, that driving badass backbeat thing, but you have to admit that this here is just objectively a cooler choice. The most extreme example of this kind of trade-off though has to be the chill penguin stage. In the original Mega Man X, the groove is once again based on this Triceo rhythmic pattern, this time blown out to use an 8th note subdivision rather than a 16th note subdivision. This has a lot more of a laid-back feel, especially since the snare drum in this tune's drum part isn't giving us a steady backbeat as a cross rhythm against the pop clave pattern. It's working with the pattern by hitting on beat 4 of each measure, and occasionally the and of 2 as well. This slightly more laid-back feel makes a really cool contrast to the killer 16th note figure that introduces the piece. In the Game Boy version, the bass line is completely changed to create a samba-type feel, emphasizing a much more complex, syncopated rhythm than the laid-back 8th note pop clave pattern found in the original. In fact, the bass line is by itself implying two different rhythms playing against each other. We have the lower notes giving us the basic 1-5-1 one, one of each chord on the downbeats, with beat 3 of each measure anticipated by a 16th note. This is a very common Latin bass pattern on its own, but the Game Boy bass line also adds in these upper octave fifths in the syncopated 16th note rhythm that works around the main bass line to create a bunch of forward momentum. When there are seven other channels to take care of the rest of the groove, the bass can afford to leave a lot of space. But when you've only got a couple of channels to work with, they each have to do a lot on their own. More so than just creating a chill penguin samba, though, this version of the bass line has a much more interesting dynamic with the melody. See, in the original Super Nintendo version, the melody is also constantly emphasizing the same pop clave pattern, with just about every bar rhythmically anticipating beat 3 and giving us some kind of accented note on beat 4. This means that there's not really any rhythmic tension being generated. All of the parts are pretty much in lockstep with each other, aside from a few little 16th note flourishes in the accompanying chord part. The Game Boy version not only changes the feel of the accompaniment, creating some rhythmic contrast between the melody and the bass, but the melody is also played with no attack. It swells into each note in this rhythmically vague, dreamy way that just floats above the busy bass line and staccato chord punctuation. Hitting these floaty and dreamy and frantic and busy elements against each other creates a lot more drama in the Game Boy version of the track. In both versions, the music begins to build as we move to these trading A-flat and B-flat chords, the intensity rising until we burst back into that insane 16th note line that opened up the piece. 
In the Super Nintendo version, this build is achieved almost entirely through the drums and the chord stabs picking up steam, but the bass becomes a little more active as well and the melody starts to pick up slightly more intricate 16th note rhythms to aid in the crescendo. This works, but I think the Game Boy version makes this build even more exciting in spite of having a lot less to work with. The melody for the A flat to B flat section all of a sudden gains some attack, dropping the floaty quality in order to be able to be much more rhythmically precise. It uses this new power to syncopate the melody in interesting ways, anticipating beats and playing off of the bass part. Compare the two versions of this section on screen as you listen to the Game Boy's melody. Personally, I think that build works a lot better than the Super Nintendo version, even without the drums and chord parts there to help it out. Now, I'm not trying to come in here and crap on the Mega Man X soundtrack. It's a great soundtrack, and like I said earlier, all of these cool musical choices come with some trade-offs. The Game Boy sound chip is just a lot less sonically varied and interesting, so you don't get those driving drum parts or that satisfying SNES bass slap. But even so, I do find the Game Boy versions generally more interesting to listen to, thanks to the smart musical tweaks made to each tune. I don't know whether these tweaks were problem solving to get these tunes to sound good on such limited hardware, or creative decisions actively trying to improve on the originals, but either way I really like the results. Let me know which version you like better in the comments below. If you liked what you saw and you want to support the channel, you can check out my Patreon page. I gotta say thanks to Freddy for giving me the idea for this video, and thank you all for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one.